Good evening. I'm Sarah Miglio, Dean of Curriculum and Advising. Before Dr. Jay Wood formally introduces our guest, I'd like to welcome you to the first of two evenings focused on Augustine's Confessions. As you know, the Wheaton College community has been reading, discussing, and meditating upon this ancient but remarkably relevant text as a part of our core book program this year. We selected Augustine's Confessions because of its timeless truths and its relevance to our Christ at the Core curriculum. Augustine begins Confessions describing a universal problem, that our hearts are uneasy, they're restless, until they come to rest upon God. As we read this classic text together as a Christian community, it raises for us enduring questions, such as, do I know God? What do I desire? Will I be made whole? Can I be forgiven? What's love? Through his own spiritual journey, Augustine points to the transformative power of scripture and God's grace to quiet our restless hearts and work genuine change in God's people. I'm glad that we can explore these perennial themes together. It's good that we read together, discuss together, and then come together to learn from eminent scholars. We have the privilege of hearing Dr. Joseph Clare's lecture, which will then be followed by a time of conversation between Dr. Clare and Dr. Sarah Borden, chair of Wheaton's philosophy department, along with Dr. Brian McGraw, who chairs our Department of Political Science and International Relations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jay Wood, Professor of Philosophy, who will introduce our speaker. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Joseph Clare, who serves as director of the William Penn Honors Program and as an assistant professor of religious studies at George Fox University. Before joining the George Fox faculty in 2013, he earned his PhD in Religion, Ethics, and Politics program at Princeton University, while also working as an assistant in instruction. His efforts were rewarded with the Department of Religion Teaching Award and a Graduate Prize Fellowship from Princeton Center for Human Values. Prior to Princeton, Clare earned a Master of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge as a Gates Cambridge Scholar. He also holds master's degrees from Fordham and Duke University, and most importantly, as well as a bachelor's degree from Wheaton College. His research and teaching interests include Christian thought and ethics and the role of religion in public life. He is the author of Discerning the Good in the Letters and Sermons of Augustine, Oxford University Press 2016, and Reading Augustine on Education, Salvation, Happiness, and the Gift of Reading, Bloomsbury 2018. The title of this evening's talk is Turn Us to You, Augustine's Confessions for the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Clare. Thank you so much. It's a true honor and privilege to be able to be here to give this talk. I never would have imagined it as an undergrad to be invited back in this way. I also would have never imagined having Dr. Jay Wood introduce me. I only have received, only ever received one C on a paper in my life as a student, and it was in an epistemology seminar with Jay Wood. So this is particularly satisfying, Jay. Thank you very much. <laughs> but tonight we turn to the Confessions. Augustine of Hippo, the early Christian bishop, lived at the end of the Roman Empire in trying political and religious times, 354 to 430 AD. He is in some ways the architect of Western Christianity. Luther quipped that after Jesus and Paul, no one has done more to shape the Christian faith than Augustine of Hippo. Augustine's own student, Prosper of Aquitaine, said that if anyone tells you they've read all of Augustine's writings, they're a liar. Why? Because he was so prodigious. A hundred treatises, 250 letters, a thousand sermons, there's more to find. Five million wor words in total, more than anyone else from the ancient world. Of all this, 
Four major works have come down to us. The City of God on the Trinity, on Christian teaching, and perhaps most influential, the Confessions. We're not totally sure why Augustine wrote the Confessions. It comes in the middle of his life, 10 or so years after his great grand conversion in Book 8 that you'll read about if you haven't gotten there yet. He's been forcibly ordained a pastor and then bishop for three years. He's back in his home terrain of North Africa. And he launches into a book called Confessions. Its total uniqueness surprises us. Some people think of it as the first spiritual autobiography or even autobiography. Never has anyone so self-consciously laid bare their own soul and rehearsed in memory the first 31 years of their life. There's no literary analogs to it. Thing that comes closest might be Marcus Aurelius's meditations or King David's Psalms. Why did he write it? He wants to give an account of his life before God and to God. There's some who think that Augustine needed to justify his own checkered moral and religious and philosophical past now as a great leader in the church. But even so, that wouldn't quite make sense of a book this grand in scope, this stirring. It's unquestionably a great book by all accounts, by any standard of a great text. It asks the big perennial questions. It's had massive influence on Western civilization. But even so, is it worth our time? Why do we still read the Confessions? Why did you freshmen here tonight have to read it as the freshman year read or are about to read it? Why is it part of the first year seminar? I submit to you tonight that although as a great work it's perennial, perennially relevant, it's particularly relevant for us today and salient for your journey in college. First, the confession speaks directly to our own moment in higher education. Given the bright lights of Augustine's conversion in the garden at Milan, it's easy to miss that the subplot of Augustine's spiritual story is his own miseducation as a Roman elite. It's the story and the lamentation of one of Rome's most excellent sheep. He was a climber, an achiever. He'd been sharpening the resume virtues from a very early age. Looking back, he laments that there's been a divorce between his own intellectual formation and his character stemming from the very beginning of his educational journey. In book one, he says, there in school, the program for right living presented to me as a boy was that I must obey my mentors so that I might get on in this world and ex excel in the skills of the tongue, skills which lead to high repute and deceitful riches. To this end, I was sent to school to learn my letters, though I, poor wretch, could see no point in them. The story of his educational Journey is the core story of these opening books. He goes from his own little hometown in Tagast on to Madara and on to Carthage and then on as a teacher of the liberal arts in Rome and then Milan. Augustine personifies two different motives for his education in the voices of his mother and father. He says, both my parents were very keen on my making progress in school. My father, because he thought next to nothing about you, God, and only vain things about me, and my mother, because she regarded the customary course of liberal arts as no hindrance and even a considerable help toward my gaining you eventually. Maybe that's some of your situation being sent to Wheaton. One parent sees a bright career, the other parent is hoping that God gets a hold of you while you're here. Augustine laments that the intellectual purpose of his education, the question, what should I know? has been swallowed entirely by the economic purpose of his education. What will I make? Not just in terms of money, but what will I make of myself in terms of repute? The external rewards of pay and the internal rewards of ego are his only motivation. These motives flower in what he calls the disordered desire 
for goods of the flesh and goods of the mind when he gets to his freshman year at Carthage. Has anyone made it to book three? His freshman year at Carthage? Here's what he says. So I arrived at Carthage, a freshman in parentheses, where the din of scandalous love affairs raged cauldron-like around me. I was not yet in love, but I was enamored with the idea of love, and so deep within me was my need that I hated myself for the sluggishness of my desires. In love with loving, I was casting about for something to love. Yet this inner famine created no pangs of hunger in me. Because the more empty I was, the more I turned from it in re revulsion. My soul's health was consequently poor. It was covered with sores and flung itself out of doors, longing to soothe its misery by rubbing against sensible things. Yet these were soulless and so could not be truly loved. I arrived at Carthage. The din of scandalous love affairs raged cauldron-like around me. Sounds like Wheaton College, doesn't it? In remembering his own liberal arts education, Augustine presents his life as both student and teacher in photographic negative. How not to go about getting a liberal arts education. Confessions drips with moral realism about his true motives for learning. Not only careerism and success, but also intellectual scorekeeping, vanity, also the perplexing and mixed motives that we have as human beings for any of the goods that we end up pursuing, goods of the mind and goods of the body. Augustine is a master of the shadows and subtleties of the interior life, the habits of self-deception. He wants his education to be something more. He wants to be transformed, but he's not sure how. He runs into one intractable problem in the journey at school, and that's himself, his disordered desires. In the confessions, in the untangling of the knots of his own past, through his memory, he forges a fundamentally new understanding of human nature. This strikes me as a second particularly salient, relevant bit from the confessions for us today, especially in college education. Although not true of all of Augustine's many works, the title Confessions is significant in this case. In this one word, confessio, Augustine sums up his attitude to the human condition. Confessio is the new key with which he hoped to unlock the riddle of evil in the world. It allowed him to move beyond the dualisms of Manichaeanism that he encounters early and then Platonism in book seven later. The hallmark of Manichaean dual dualism is that there are two opposing principles in the world, a principle of good and evil, a principle of light and dark, both at war with each other in the world. And that, Augustine says, allows us to actually distance ourselves from the evil we experience within our own lives as some foreign element, enemy, to be extricated. He says that the hallmark of Manichaeanism for him is the avoidance of confession. He says that it had pleased my pride to be free from a sense of guilt, and when I had done anything wrong, not to confess that it was myself who had done it. My evil nature, the evil principle, had made me do it. Augustine finds a different kind of dualism in Platonism, a kind of self-reliance that depicts the stainless, spotless metal soul tainted by the mud spots of the body and the material world. But in Confessions, Augustine offers us a nuanced, complex picture of human nature, a new anthropology that allows us to resist the dualistic thinking of Manichaeanism and Platonism. Here, Augustine allows us to understand through the privation theory of evil that our wills, our very souls are wounded by sin and the consequences of original sin, but that evil is not a thing at war with the good in us, but it is a lack. It is a privation, he says, 
It's a rusting away of the goodness of God and creation in the soul. Here Augustine takes this newfound philosophical idea of privation, understands it within the arc of the biblical narrative of original goodness in creation, the present temporary fallenness of human nature and the future hope of redemption unveiled in Christ. And he's able to give us a much more nuanced picture of the human person. In every human being, there is something good to be celebrated about their nature, something to be lamented and mourned, and a future hope of restoration, of redemption. I think today I find myself tempted by all sorts of dualisms as I look at the world. Black and white thinking, dicing the world up between good and evil people, lacking nuance. We like to align ourselves with the purely good and avoid the bad. We are in some ways in the era of the anti-confessions. We want not to confess our own sins, but to confess others for them and shame them in doing so. We hope, like Manichaeans, to extricate and exculpate ourselves entirely, proving ourselves the Illuminati firmly on the right side of history. We act in some ways as if evil is a force or a principle external to us, even if inside of us, something we could extricate ourselves from if we tried hard, of a, hard enough. But for Augustine, naming the sins of others or of the past is unintelligible from naming our own sins. This ought not be read as a fatalistic resignation to evil and injustice in the world, an inability to name or to seek to uproot. It's not a license for turning a blind eye or passivity toward the world. Rather, it is a humble reminder that social criticism must find self-criticism as its companion. Naming and rooting out injustice, evil, vice, and sin must be done simultaneously with recognizing our own participation in it. Evil is in us in the negative sense of privation, of rust. But really, Augustine gives a privation theory of evil, this kind of rotting away, this evaporation of the good, he gives it an entirely new cast in the Confessions. It's not rust, but sickness that Augustine gives us. He gets some of this from ancient philosophy, a lot of it from the Psalms, but it's fundamentally a new picture of human nature, a new medical language for the blindness, for the fever, for the illness, for the unwholeness of the soul when we speak of sin. Listen to Augustine in book four. He says, I carried about me a cut and bleeding soul that could not bear to be carried by me. And where I could put it, I could not discover, not in pleasant groves, not in games and singing, nor in the fragrant corners of a garden, not in the company of a dinner table, not in the delights of the bed, not even in my books and poetry. My soul floundered in a void and fell back upon me. I remained a haunted spot which gave me no rest from which I could not escape. From where could my heart flee from my heart? Where could I escape from myself? Where would I not dog my own footsteps? Still, I left my hometown. For Augustine, we are responsible for all of our own actions, but we are also dislocated by an ancient fall. For him, the fall is intensely personal. He sees it as a field of forces in the heart of each of us, an agonizing weakness that forced him to flee from himself. Augustine, I think, would largely agree with Alexander Solzhenitsyn's great quote that the battle line between good and evil runs through the heart of every human being. It's that fundamental humility and self-criticism that Augustine thinks must accompany all of our work of naming and uprooting the evils that we find in the world. It's a much more complex, a much more nuanced view of the picture in which we see our own participation. The first awareness, therefore, of confessio must be our need to be healed. And Christ is both the doctor and the medicine 
who comes to Augustine in the Confessions. Third and finally, what brings Augustine so close to us and makes the book so relevant today is his restlessness, his restless pursuit of what John Calvin calls true wisdom, knowledge of oneself and knowledge of God. Augustine bemoans that after all these years of study as both student and teacher, he's made no progress in the realm of true self-knowledge. He's distracted not by his smartphone, but by his own self, his cares, his preoccupations, his twisted desires. So he attempts to drive deeper into himself as he discovers the heights and hills of Platonism in Book 7 of the Confession, Confessions. But as he turns inward to himself, there he does not find the calm inner reality of the philosophers. For Augustine, the turn inward toward the self is precarious. He says, there indeed is some light in us, but let us walk fast, walk fast, lest the shadows come. Our conscious mind and attention is ringed with shadows. Inwardly, Augustine feels that he moves in a limitless forest full of unexpected danger, he says in book 10. What then am I, my God? What is my true nature? A living thing taking innumerable forms, quite limitless. Augustine never seems more contemporary, more ahead of his time than when he seems like us, infatuated with self-knowledge. He's in a flurry to locate his true self. He's trying to find it. Here we are today, like Augustine, stuck between the Delphic maxim, know thyself, and the contemporary maxim, know thy selfie. We are in some ways stuck between self-examination and self-creation. We know there's an inner pearl of precious price if we could just get away from our phones long enough. And yet we know there's an identity to be forged. Someone to become if I could just like the right string of photos on Instagram and be known. But Augustine inaugurates in the confessions, and I take this to be the great achievement of the work and relevance for us, especially in college. He inaugurates a new means and model for knowing ourselves, and it's this, reading, reading books. The great gift of Augustine's confessions is that he takes us on the journey toward true wisdom with him, faltering, incomplete, hesitatingly, knowing that there's no way through the self except through the self. He shows us that self-knowledge is available in new ways through reading books. He inaugurates a new kind of self-knowledge that I call textual self-understanding. Reading cultivates good habits of attention, of the conscience, of empathy. Ultimately, it can transform us. But for Augustine, he shows us a new way to vulnerably read to expose ourselves to the text. Notice in book three, when he encounters Cicero's Hortensius, he says he's not humble enough to encounter scripture, but in the course of studies, he reads Cicero's exhortation to philosophy. What does he find? He says the book transformed my whole way of feeling, transformed the character of my prayers and my desires because it was an exhortation to the immortality of wisdom. It lifted his own soul up above the fray of his own careerist impulses, his own infatuation with his love of the material world. Ultimately, this new view of reading reaches its high watermark in Augustine's encounter with Scripture. Watch the way Augustine reads the Bible. He reads himself into the text. I know you're not supposed to do that. I see some of my exegesis teachers here. But Augustine reads himself into the text. He is Adam 
in book one of the confessions, good and created, but fallen. He is the prodigal son wayfaring and welcomed home by the father. He is ultimately the psalmist in book nine, allowing the Psalms to be cried out in love to God, it says that the Psalms inflame his love for God, giving him words like little boats for his soul to make its way back to God. My daughter Esme just turned seven and she may be a budding actress, but she's got this amazing ability to go on one week spurts imitating whatever character we just saw in the last movie or play. It's Mary Poppins, it's Moana, it's Lucy. Just go down the list. She fully inhabits the characters and it's in that childlike inhabitation of the actress we find Augustine the reader, fully catapulting not just his mind but his affections into the text, allowing scripture to do its work on him allowing the medicine of Christ through words, through the word, to be administered to his soul, through books, through reading. Sure, there was some good stuff on reading in the ancient world, the art of moral reading. You get a bit of it in Seneca, but there is nothing like this on reading in the ancient world. Augustine inaugurates an entirely new view of the spiritually transformative powers of reading. For him, a book becomes a mirror by which we can see ourselves. Not just our faults, but in scripture, who God wants us to become. We read in dialogue, in dialogue with the ages, with the authors, in dialogue with our very own soul, in dialogue ultimately and hopefully with God, the word himself. Reading is the joint exegesis of the words and of ourself our soul. And in this beautiful practice, we receive ourselves in the gift of words, in the word. It's not self-examination to find the unstained, unvarnished pearl of the soul. It's not self-creation, Nietzsche or Rorty, allowing us to unlimitedly create ourselves and inhabit new stories imaginatively fashioning ourselves. No, it's self-reception and really the story crescendos in Confessions 8. Augustine's conversion happens in a garden in Milan. How does it happen? Does anyone know? Any freshmen ever make it that far yet? No, he hears something. What does he hear? Okay, this is coming later. He hears the voice of children playing a game that he's never heard before. He's not sure if he's actually hearing them, but what are the words of the game song that they sing? Pick it up and read. Pick it up and read. And he goes. Pay attention carefully to book eight of the confessions. It is the most deep meditation on reading in the history of thought. Augustine talks about the way we can read and be transformed by talking about stories he's heard of other people who have read stories and been transformed by them. Specifically the story of Saint Anthony in Egypt, the Desert Father. He says, I heard the story of these courtiers in Trier who had heard the story of the way Saint Anthony went into the church and heard, remember in the ancient world reading involved hearing, the word of the gospel, go sell all your possessions. And he immediately was converted and obeyed. Augustine hears the words, take up and read. He cracks open the letters of Paul that he happens to have with him in the garden, finds Romans 13, put off the deeds of the flesh and walk in the light. And he says, I was immediately converted to you. I was transformed. Notice how striking and strangely bizarre and childlike the high point of reading is in the confessions. He hears the voice of little children saying, take up and read, and he plays a game of Bible bingo with the letters of Paul, and he's converted. He's been talking about reading Plotinus with Simplicianus earlier in Milan, and now he's opening to the first passage his eyes alight on in Romans 13, and the word strikes his heart. 
he receives a new life. He receives himself. Confessions is ultimately about the importance of reading books to become ourselves and to know God. As I look at my copies of Confessions, I've just now gotten a chance to dive into this beautiful translation that you all are enjoying. We'll hear from the translator tomorrow. But my copy, Maria Bolding's translation, is inscribed, Joseph Clare, Fall 2001. I've had it for 17 years. I bought it 17 years ago next week, I think. No one ever assigned this book to me at Wheaton College, by the way. So I had to buy it on my own at Borders in Donata. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember this thing called Borders, but it used to rule the day. I got home from fall break feeling pretty beaten up. My girlfriend, who is now my wife, moved out to Colorado to work on a dude ranch the year before I graduated. She was a year ahead of me. And she was and is the most stunning woman I've ever seen. I saw her my first day I transferred here as a sophomore. Maybe that's why I didn't read the confessions. <laughs> it was not a ring by spring scenario. I went and found her on this ranch and we broke up. We broke up. I had flown home to Portland and gotten a car from my parents and was driving back from Colorado to get back by Monday morning after fall break to take my Greek exam in Dr. Penny's class. But on my way through Lincoln, Nebraska, I totaled my parents' car. Heart sick on the open road, took Amtrak back to downtown Chicago and like barely breezed in in time for my Greek exam which I think I may have gotten worse than a C on, so maybe, I won't keep talking about my grades, but it's a sign that your grades don't define you ultimately. But I went to Borders that next week and I bought the confessions. I bought the confessions because the first class I took at Wheaton College was historical theology with a guy named Bob Weber. And I learned to love the church fathers and learn about ancient Christianity. I always knew I should read this book. And this book has traveled with me. The scrawls and marginalia reveal the record of these 17 years of my journey since. There are many definitions of a great book or a great text, but the one that sticks with me is a great book is a book that reads us. And that's precisely what this book has been doing. The big questions that this college introduced me to, who am I, what's my purpose? What's the good life? Have been partly answered now in the way I have lived these 17 years and in the reading that I've done. This book has been more than a mirror. It's been a signpost. It's been a window by which I have glimpsed the great mysteries of God, of sin, and the good life. Confession stands as a testimony of authentic education. This book ought to be, and now is, at your school, the cornerstone of a Christian liberal arts education, both in its content but also its form. For Augustine provides not only a book that reads us, but he gives us a model and picture of how to read and to be read, how to be transformed by classics and by the word. This college and this book have so thoroughly shaped who I am. Like Augustine says of Cicero's Hortensius, this book and this college have changed my way of feeling and being in the world. My gratitude is eternal. Whenever I go home, I always go look at a dictionary at my parents' place. It's my grandmother's handy college Webster dictionary that she gave me before I went to Wheaton College. My grandmother was a woman who didn't finish high school, Holy Rosary in West Seattle. She was crippled with rheumatoid arthritis in a wheelchair, lived alone for the second half of her life, but she was a reader. She read voraciously. On the back of the toilet at her little apartment, 
in Corvallis was always a stack of greats. Dostoevsky's The Idiot, Lewis's screw tape letters, Chesterton's Orthodoxy. I always just thought, how in the world does grandma read those books? It's because she had the handy college Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> she passed away about the time I took off for college. And I think she would just laugh now and maybe is laughing to think of the ride and journey I've been on at this college in graduate school, getting to start a great books program at another Christian liberal arts college, getting paid to read the greats and to be read by them. So my hope and prayer for you freshmen is in the midst of the stress, the challenge, the difficulty, the boredom, the joy, do not forget, do not neglect that you have been assigned and given time to read books. My one prayer for you is that in this time that you would learn to read books and especially Augustine's Confessions. Thank you very much. been given the task of asking all the hard questions that you were wanting to ask. So we'll see if we can come up with those. Did you have? I Please have, go ahead and I've start. Got, go ahead and start. I, we had dinner together this evening, the philosophy department and uh, Dr. Claire, and I warned him this question was coming. But e after his talk, I feel even more pressingly. I want to know, what advice would you give to students reading the confessions, particularly in light of your concern that books read us, that we're shaped and formed by our books. Um, what advice do you give to students reading the confessions whose wounds are different from Augustine's, who uh, for them, being a climber, reputation, ego are not their struggles. They may struggle to feel a sense of worth, a place in the world that pride, at least as Augustine articulates it, isn't their major issue and it may be quite the opposite. How do you read books that aren't your book in that sense? That's, that's a fantastic question. Um, there is a worry, I think, about Augustine's uh, confessions that it is very much um, the spiritual struggles and transformation of an extraordinarily privileged Roman male elite who was on this ascendant sort of tear to the top, right? He, by the time of his conversion at 31, 32, he was the imperial professor of rhetoric. So that's like the crowning, you know, liberal art of the trivium. It's an imperially appointed position and be like the chair of government at Harvard or something at 31. So he's kind of at the top. It has, there's public, you know, office that would be associated with that kind of teaching role. So isn't Augustine, yeah, good. So all of us other white, male, privileged, arrogant, um, you know, sort of climbers, we can really resonate with this book and there you go. I think that... Um, I think that would be to miss the incredible nuance of the way Augustine thinks about his wounds. Um, and I, I do really treasure the way he thinks of the brokenness of sin um, in the language of guilt, but also of woundedness or sickness in the soul. And it's in the subtle, the really subtle in-between lines, not the glitzy stuff where Augustine talks about being shamed by his dad at the bathhouse in North Africa for not seeming manly enough in physical stature with his dad's friends around, or the way in which his mother's own prayers and tears reveal to him a kind of spiritual stamina that his father has none of. I mean, so Augustine, not to make too much of the subversion of the kind of prototypical patriarchal Roman male dominant. Augustine's got an African mother, a Berber, um, someone from Algeria present day. His father is an Italian, maybe more white, a patrician. He's got a, an extremely complex set of identities uh, that he's negotiating, even as he comes from the outside, the margins of the empire. He doesn't fit in. So his, his like starvation for repute and riches is actually not coming from someone who like went to the right private school and was on their way to Harvard. So he has the anxieties, I think, very much of being um, not quite enough. That said, I think that Augustine, in his understanding of his wounds, he's also like very sensitive to the forms of self-deceit 
uh, that accompany our victimization and our woundedness. So that, I know that's a dangerous terrain, but I think he does understand the relationship between understanding oneself as wounded by one's own sins, by one's own past, but by others, and also the way in which we exculpate ourselves and deceive ourselves of our own agency and capacity in those wounds. So that's, I mean, that, that gets into complex terrain, but it's a terrific question. So I was hoping to pick up on something that you, your last point about sort of uh, reading of books, which I, you know, as as a as someone who spent way too much time in, in graduate school, although I think you may have more degrees than I do, actually, which is impressive, um, or sad, <laughs> I can't tell which. Um, but, uh, but you, like I, have spent a lot of time around people who've read a lot of books and who are not... To, put too fine a point on it, moral cretins. Mm. Um, uh, academia is filled with them. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so maybe, I, maybe you could talk a little bit about, I mean, what does it mean to read well, read in a way that allows the book to read you? Because there are plenty of people who are extraordinarily skilled readers, who are much more literate than I, who've, who've done, done things with these texts that I, I, I lack the capacities to do, and yet, this, this is not their story. Yep. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I think, you know, the, the real divorce between intellectual ability and acuity and character formation that I mentioned in the, the first part, that's really one of the subplots of Confessions. Is it, It's not just a Christian lamentation. Seneca does this in his moral letters. It's like, how could you possibly be so good and so specialized in your knowledge, but so ignorant in terms of the moral life, in terms of... Uh, the arts of the soul. Um, that, that I think, is the question. And, um, you know, Wendell Berry, I just read this line, he says, the disease of our age um, is specialization. And uh, the disease of our character in this age is specialization. And I think that that's a, a way of thinking about Augustine's own um, refutation and rejection of liberal education in the later Roman Empire is that it's so instrumentally geared toward an end. Again, not to say we all need jobs, you need paychecks, you got to pay Wheaton back your student loans um, and have the American dream, etc. But when the purpose of learning, what should I know, and the moral purpose of learning, who should I become, how should I respond? What should I worship? Is totally subordinated to the economic end of what will I make? Then we lose sight of um, the capacities um, of transformation in learning, especially reading. So how do we do it? I think we have to be careful about the kinds of ways we cultivate students here in this audience to think about reading texts. You know, I think that there's moments in our education that need to be not disciplinary deep dives into the contextual details or the fine-grained analysis of the text, but moments where we all, students and teachers, come as amateur human beings reading the text and asking, so what? What does it mean? Where do you see yourself in the text? You know, how does this, uh, how ought I alter my spirit or my life in response to what I'm reading in this text? Do we do that in college education? Do we do it very well? Um, I feel like in the secular worlds, partly where I've been educated, we almost have not enough shared moral vocabulary or grammar to even have those moments of profound where the text becomes a mirror and a chisel on the self and we ask the more spiritual and existential questions. So thank God to be in a context where you should be able to ask those questions and have discussions. Uh, but to achieve the kind of trust and vulnerability in which that discussion would actually be meaningful and uh, lives would be uh, challenged and changed and transformed. That's the role of the educator. And I think Augustine sees that he hasn't been trained to do that. <laughs> I really like your notion of self-reception through reading. Mm. And this is a different way of reading book eight than I'd really been thinking about yeah. it in the confessions. I found myself wondering, though, what practices would you recommend if one wants to be self-receptive in that way? What practices do you recommend for cultivating that self-reception, but also protecting oneself from bad books? You see what they're doing to me with these questions? I like it when it's the audience, but the, the philosophy professor and the politics professor have been sicked on me. 
Um, these are tough questions. That That's great. I actually, I wonder if Augustine is setting himself up as imitative exemplar in book eight, or if he's actually uh, celebrating the kind of joy and hilarity of the gospel. Um, so actually, you should do that in one of your classes, one of your Bible classes, um, as you're working your way methodically reconstructing the ancient Near East, you should have one day where you just crack it open, see what passage is there, and then go around and meditatively read and ask everyone um, where they see themselves in the text. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's cheeky, but I think there's ways of reading um, that presume forms of childlikeness and disposition of spirit that I think Augustine wants to, as he's been in the heavy waters of the Neoplatonic circles in Milan and Book 8, you know, and the really deep readings of Porphyry and Plotinus, he's like, check this part out, where finally the restless heart found rest when I heard the voice of children singing, pick it up and read. I mean, so imitate a pattern. I think that part of that should be like, don't take yourself so seriously. There's a kind of intellectual seriousness um, that can damage um, authentic education, I think Augustine says there. But what? how do we guard ourselves from books that might be misleading? Well, that's in the confession. So I hope you all discuss this next week if you haven't got to book one. How does Augustine describe his experience with Homer and with Virgil? He describes himself as confused, encountering the behavior of the gods and those myths at such a young age, wondering if he's supposed to imitate <laughs> the behavior of the gods, which if you've read these books is not necessarily part of moral uh, formation to imitate the gods, but he doesn't know how to read. He doesn't know what the moral reading of those texts is. He's not given the skills. And he says that his affections are being shaped by those words. Uh, so my sense is that, hey, Augustine's right when he says that the, the classics, the gifts of the pagans are like the gold of the Egyptians. There's great things to take great things to glean, great ways to sharpen the mind and the heart, but they need to be put to good use, let they, lest they use us. And I think really the antidote he offers, the counter therapy, the disordered therapy of reading Homer and Virgil in book one is the deep therapy of reading the Psalms in book nine, where he, he says, my loves are being reconstructed. I'm given a moral vocabulary by which I can send up every affection from rage to joy to real love to God in these words. So he's given, and of course, that's the beauty of the confessions, which I'd love to talk to uh, Sarah Rudin about, is just how much of the Psalms are in the confessions. It's just overwhelmingly wrought with the Psalms. And to think that Augustine dictated most of the confessions and did not have books around him for footnotes. This is just coming out of his mind and his heart, you know, that much scripture and textual references. Just beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So you mean to say that your Wheaton education didn't give you the ability just to kind of, you know, rip off quotes from everywhere? Um, sorry, philosophy department. Um, the, uh, so I, I wonder if, I, I really like the idea that, um, that there is, that Augustine offers a kind of antidote to our, what we might think of as kind of our modern Manichaeanism, right? Sort of our, our, our desire to sort of, uh, put us on one side of this bright dividing line. Um, I wonder if you might, I mean, you've taught this, or you taught this to undergrads, uh, and what do you think sort of, wh where are the uh, places in which um, our students struggle with kind of taking him seriously, mm. right? With with thinking that this is really something I need to be opened up to, that I need to, that this is something that that indeed I can think of him as a kind of a partner in this, in this sort of uh, reflective self um, engagement uh, and whatnot. Mm. Yeah, um, I find students, when I did this, um, text when I was a grad instructor at Princeton, totally underwhelmed by his um, disordered desire in his college days and the sexual exploits. They were expecting something a little more, you know, Twitterfied than than what they got there. So it's like, oh, really a, 
a roiling cauldron full of disordered desire in Carthage. It's like, come on, really? What? What are you talking about? So there's a kind of, uh, I think, secrecy, even as Augustine is very open in his confessions, there's a kind of awareness um, of the mysterious terrain of the heart. So it's not an exploitive tell-all, you know, sort of, it's not an autobiography or even a spiritual autobiography in the modern sense. And I think uh, students can find that underwhelming. I think the thing too, there's really heavy waters, say Manichaeanism, for example. I mean, he walks you through like really, really tough terrain thinking about different theories of evil and materialism and uh, then privation theory of evil with the Platonists. It leaves us wondering why you would be writing with such feeling about the terrain of the restless heart and the heart's, you know, the restless heart's journey to find rest. And then all of a sudden you're like into the deeps in ins and outs, you know, of astrology and cosmology with the Manichaeans. But I think that's just a, I mean, a sign of his genius, but a rebuke to our own um, overly emotive understandings of the spiritual life, our overly, our, our, relux, our reluctance to think that re deep rational reflection and really florid, heartfelt, moving reflection on God and the sport, spiritual life are at odds. They're not at odds. I mean, in some ways, that's the achievement of the book is that the God of the philosophers and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob come together, but it's in this profoundly moving terrain of the heart. And so I think students, I, I find those parts troubling and so the or not troubling but challenging to make it through that um, the students do too then there's also like what do you do with the last four books like what happened like I was following along for nine books where he gets converted and then his mom passes away in book nine and that's all awesome and then what he's talking about memory for 60 pages and then he breaks into an exegesis of the first lines of Genesis for three chapters I mean what is going on and I think again that just speaks to our inability to imagine that the book is not a spiritual autobiography it's not a story he's telling he's trying to take you with him on his journey toward God he's trying to take you with him on the restless heart's journey to the restful heart in God. And he thinks the way he's going to do that with you is at the end to try to think deeply about how to hear the word, the wisdom of God speaking in scripture. He wants to take you there right to the very beginning of the words and show you a new way of reading the text as part of He's taking you into the present of his own life rather than just giving you this retrospective on his own spiritual um, conversion. So yeah, that's a, that's a bit of it, but I would, that's a great I would say that one of the nice, one of the things I really like about uh, Sarah Rudin's translation is the way in which these, these various um, aspects are sometimes separated by white space. Mm. So you get the sense that there is a, there are, you know, different modes of his, mm. um, of his deliberations. I, I taught it for the first time two years ago, and I found myself oftentimes sort of whipsawed between Again, very sophisticated analyses of these these very deep concepts, and and then what seemed to me just in my you know good 21st century way of like very florid, uh, over the top kinds of uh, 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 kinds of rhetoric. But but the spacing actually really helps, and I think it helps students as well to, mm. to see that. It's great. Can I follow up with a question that I think all of us have had at various points? Mm -hmm. The pear tree. The pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't do it for love of his friends. He doesn't do it for love of anything but the sin itself. Yep. And then the privation theory and the woundedness you emphasize. How do you read the pear tree? What does he love? Yeah, that is, um, the pear tree is a strange story. Let's be honest, right? He's clearly done some other uh, kind of sultry, distasteful stuff, but he's going to just take you for chapters through in book two, meditating on why in the world they shook the pear tree and fed the fruit to the pigs, you know, of all things. It's like, wow, I wish I had that much time to meditate on that sin of my youth. I mean, was that really a big deal? Can't you just get over it? Get over the pear tree. I think what, uh, apart from the, the rich symbolism of trees and gardens and fruit, right, which is such a, I love the modern library, uh, what they did with the cover for the the half-eaten pear, it's perfect. 
Um, Augustine seems to give you a whole set of reasons uh, and motivations for doing it right off the bat. He's like, well, we were out at night. I was with my team. I was showing off. I was all these things. That's why we did it. We didn't want to eat the fruit, but here's reasons why. And then he circles back and goes, no, on further reflection, I cannot find one good account of my motive for doing that, right? So it's truly like, why would you shake the pear tree just to feed uh, the fruit? You want to go with them and just say, no, you were right earlier that you did it out of a false form of friendship and camaraderie. You were showing off with your buddies. I mean, I, I can imagine, and I'm pretty sure I did stuff like that, where it was purely out of the kind of daringness of camaraderie. And did you do that? You know, did you really throw that piece of fruit at the passing car or whatever? But the Augustine seems totally dissatisfied with that by the end of the section in, in book two. But he comes to this idea, and I think ultimately he's trying to remember himself as Adam. He's trying to imagine himself as Adam and Eve in the garden and imagine why would you have ever eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the first place? Why would you ever have disobeyed a command, in this case the command of conscience, which he knew was not right to do that to the farmer's fruit uh, in the orchard near the vineyard? And I think what he says ultimately to me is he says, God, in some way I was mimicking or aping your own sublimity and power by becoming a law unto myself. I was going to break the command of conscience so I could override it with being a law unto myself. And there's a kind of imitation and mimicry of God's own power, the power to command, uh, that ties into his understanding of give what you command. He wants God to actually overcome and overwhelm his will's resistance to the divine command through grace. So I would say it's, it's, it's that. I mean, he's trying to take you as far down the line to the mystery of original sin as he can get you. Like, why in the world did we disobey in the first place? <laughs> Imperfection, walking in the garden, all these other trees to eat from, and boom, we did it. So there's a kind of ultimate inexplicability and mysteriousness about the first sin in general. And so he's kind of locating that as like his first sin symbolically or something. Yeah. I don't know. Someone else try it when you guys get to book two, give a better reading than that. I'm sure there is one. It's a tough passage. I do. I do think that there's something about the fact that he narrates all these sort of alternative explanations, mm. right? That he's, he's sort of telling his, the story of his telling the story or a story of his own set of reflections, which is, I think meant to give, give us a sense that, that he, he can't quite get at it, right? There's just, there, there, as you said, there's something inexplicable about it. And again, it's a, it's a way of reflecting on the way in which we never really quite know ourselves, right? We, 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 we can't quite get a hold of our own sort of motivations, and we are, we are sort of a mystery to ourselves. So it's a, the narrative itself kind of does some of the work that even the philosophy is not, you know, it's, it's oftentimes kind of hand-waving, like, no, I didn't do that. Oh, I did do that. Well, what? Because, yeah, because the, the obvious example is, yeah, you were just goofing around with a bunch of guys. And, you know, that's, that's what teenage boys do or 20 something, I guess, do boys. Yeah. Um. yeah. And it speaks to what I mentioned uh, in the talk a little bit, a privation theory of the wills uh, participation with evil. Right. So he's trying to figure out, like, how is it not that the case that there's like evil in me as an active forcible principle at war with the good in me, leaving you to posit two wills, he says, is what the Manichaeans ultimately come up with, a good will and evil will at war. So he's trying to get like. How do you theorize, how do you talk about the kind of pockmarkedness of the will, the way in which it's, it's, uh, it's been rusted out, it's, it's sick and been lessened in some way, but it's not evil as kind of this foreign alien presence at odds with himself. Um, and I think, again, the Pear Tree episode is kind of giving him the narrative frame to think about the will in a way. Yeah. Uh, just one final question, sure. if you will. Um, when we come back to your notion of receiving yourself through reading, through words, um, through stories, can you tie that theologically to the notion of Christ as the Logos and what's the theological backing or connection here? Totally. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, there's a couple dangers in thinking of reading and self-reception in this way. There's one way of like, well, how do you evaluate between good and bad books? Or how do you evaluate between reading good books and scripture, right? So there's there's this kind of hierarchy of reads, you know, and the spiritual capacities of transformation. Augustine, I think, ultimately um, wants you to recognize that 
part of your divine image bearingness, the fact that you've been made in the image of God, part of that has to do with bearing the image of the eternal word himself, Christ, in you. And that part of what's happening as you read, as you kind of gather your attention, you bring yourself to the book, and the book begins to reveal something about you. It begins to spark the conscience in some way and bring you to yourself, kind of snap to yourself. You've been reading, your eyes have been passing over the little letter clusters on the page, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I was paying attention, I'm back. I am here with myself on the page. It's one of the challenges of reading things on screens, I think, versus reading on page, uh, the kind of material way that your self is anchored there in the mirror of the text. But Augustine thinks that we're able to uh, resonate with text and have the conscience sparked in that way because the eternal word, the logos, has been stamped in us in some way. So when he gets to the words of scripture as being the kind of hierarchical peak of uh, reading or potential text to read and be read by, he's thinking already that the deep work of the reader, the sparked conscience, the aware and alive attentiveness to words has already been the work of Christ in you, the light, or in this case, the stamp of Christ in the soul uh, that has something to do with our very capacity for reason and feeling and the way he thinks of the intellect and will and the soul as bearing this kind of Trinitarian vestige uh, in us. So it, we ought not think of it in this kind of extrinsic hierarchical move from pagan books to good books to the books of scripture, and then you get to God. But the movement of good reading, the capacities for learning, for reason, for affection, and intellect and will have been part of God's wooing you through Christ, even implicitly up to that point. And I think that's the beauty of confessions as Augustine looks back across the 31 years preceding his conversion, and he realizes that God was present to him without him realizing it. God was more present to him than he was to himself, he says, now that he looks back and kind of sniffs out uh, the traces of God's presence and drawing. And part of that is because God is mysteriously present still, in the soul, even the wounded, broken, sin-stained, and torn soul, there is a vestige there, a light, a stamp of he who is the word that is trying to bring us back to him through words. Yeah. If you'll join me in thanking Dr. Claire again. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. <laughs>